gentleman is um, Dr. Martin Hall. So Dr. Hall was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and he went and got his marine biology degree at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, then he got his PhD um, in fisheries at the University of Washington. And since 1984, he's been the head of the tuna, dolphin, and bycatch program for the Inter-American um, Tropical Tuna Commission. Um, I want to thank Virginia Sea Grant and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, of which I am a graduate fellow in collaborative research in fishery science. And I want to thank the WWF for giving us the opportunity to host these talks and organize a special event. And also, I want to thank the Board of Trustees of ISTS for allowing us to try something a little different. Now, with any further ado. Thank Dr. you, Hall. Troy. Thank you, everyone of the organizers. And thank you all for being here. Uh, a few months ago, I just uh, celebrated 30 years working on bycatch. Uh, celebrated is not the word, it just happened. But uh, I've been doing this for quite, a, quite some time, and it is a good moment to think of what we learned over the years. You're not so worried of planning for the next 30 years. I will just plan for 15 years and use the free time to go and look at the past and see what we've learned. So it's an honor and a pleasure to, for me to be here with many, many friends and people I really like in the audience uh, that share many of the things that uh, we try to do, and meeting new friends on this. So I will try to uh, give you some of my experiences uh, on, the, on the subject. And uh, I'm going to, to start repeating the, the thanks to the organizers of this workshop, which gives an opportunity, especially the, the CITOR to directors broad and others. So uh, I've been working on this for many, many years. And uh, I started from directly from the university into the tuna dolphin problem. And this was like getting a boy scout and throwing the guy at Gettysburg and see, enjoy the welcome. It was really, really hot. And anything I've seen after that has been easier. So it was, it's good to start high and then you have to, you relax later on. In these years, we have won quite a few battles on bycatch. So that's something that is a certainty. As humans, we have the ability to adapt and to learn and to uh, try to avoid mistakes and repeat successes. So I think we've seen that happen. And I think that applies to every one of the participants in this type of systems. Uh, the NGOs are running more effective campaigns, the industry is responding uh, without blocking things, but following the process, scientists and managers are converging there. So I think we are finding better ways to approach the problems, but the number of problems and the diversity of problems is so large that we need more troops in the trenches. So if I do one thing today, would be get 10, 20, 30 of you to join us. And that's more important than the showing science or anything else. And uh, I want to to share experiences with you more than particular studies. So the, the first success story that I was involved in was a tuna dolphin issue. Uh, mortality has been very low for 20 years now. The dolphin populations are increasing. And my reward has been not to have to talk to tuna dolphin anymore, except in passing. Uh, I was beginning to feel like Chavi Checker singing a twist for the 25,000th time. Enough of that. So it's done, we won, we could do it, we can do it again. So that's one of them. The, another very positive experience was ex the experiments to uh, test circle hooks with a WWF program from the region, the uh, governments and other participants from the region. And the only thing I want to highlight from there, not to spend too much time, nine countries participated in this, uh, 600 boats tested the the hooks, and we put 2,300 observer in observer trips in a completely voluntary manner. Nobody was mandated to take any observer. Nobody was mandated to test the hooks. 
All of this was done working with the fishers. That's the kind of thing that you get when your approach is the correct one. And I'm very happy to have had this type of thing, that which is what makes you optimistic. So if you're going to start working on these things, the first thing is you master your troops. And to do that, we put together a very solid re regional group of researchers uh, with local uh, NGOs, uh, connecting with the local fisheries agencies, uh, with some international support. Uh, we didn't know anything about the subject, so we went to our NOAA friends from uh, Pascagoula, from San Diego, from Hawaii. Uh, OSCE from Japan was very important in gear technology. And uh, we imported our veterinarian support from Spain. And with all that technical knowledge that we didn't have, we had the troops to get started. Besides this experience from uh, technical uh, people in different places, there were some experiments or some programs going on in the region that have been very successful. So we learned a lot from Tamar and Karumbe, which are fantastic programs on the Atlantic side. And this joining experiences has been extremely valuable. So the first thing is you gather all your troops, you gather the technical expertise, both international and in the region. Uh, after that, we develop alliances with all kinds of organizations. I'm not going to do a big acknowledgement here, it will be ours, but the, uh, the funding and the basic support came from WWF, but all the governments in the region supported the program. Local NGOs, many of them participated very actively, and I want to emphasize the fishers, unions, and cooperatives from all the countries were from the very beginning participants on this. We had workshops where the national leader of the artisanal fishers was the one introducing us. So we didn't enter through the side door, we just entered working with them. And it was a fantastic example of people coming together by finding common objectives. Uh, so when you start approaching the fishermen, this is something, I don't know if it translates into English very well, but basically means uh, you come from the university, uh, you're a very sharp guy or girl, and people think so, so do you. So you start talking to this fisherman who maybe didn't finish elementary school, and you have this tendency to talk down. Well, your assumption should be that the person you're talking to is somebody whose difference with you is opportunity. So talk to that person as somebody which is a match in your IQ, and on the fishing IQ that you need, he's a lot better than you are. So you should start in a very humble position and prepare to learn. Sometimes you ruin something with a start. So don't talk down talk horizontal, and don't hesitate explaining even complicated things. You don't need long Latin words to say anything significant. So do that, and the approach should be very, very important. If you don't approach well the leadership and the individuals, it will not help you. Uh, something that is very important because there are many biologists involved in these things, you need to know about fisheries. And this is not that you have to become a gear technology before you do anything, but you really need to have more than a passing knowledge. Fisheries are things with a lot of nuances. We were talking about long lines the other day. Which long lines? Bottom long lines, uh, surface long lines, shallow or deep, vertical long lines. And all these things mean so many differences that when you're talking to fishers, you need to know exactly what you're talking to. You need to gain, gain their respect by showing that you are at least well informed of what is happening, how it's happening. This is not something that you can be uh, stingy with your time. You need to put the effort here and uh, in several other aspects. And one of my first recommendations is if you're going to work in an area, move along the, the area you're going to work with, get on the boats, look at the gear, talk to the local organizations, talk to individual fishermen, learn about the fishery before you start doing your work as much as you can. And we did it and it was very it was very very useful and very rewarding. And I'm going to use this uh, example later on to show you how knowledge about gear can help you save turtles. Uh, these are entanglements, which in some areas are 
probably more significant than hookings for, as a source of mortality, and how we address this through understanding how the gear is made and materials and so on. Uh, the other part is getting to know the fishing community. There are other biologists that can work in a laboratory and do everything you want. This is human interaction. First of all, uh, you're working in the planet of top down doesn't work. So you need to interact with people to get things to happen. And for that, you need to know how the communities are structured. Is there a vertical leadership? Who are the leaders? How are they organized? You approach a cooperative, and that cooperative is linked to a political party. So suddenly, you are involved in something you don't want to be involved. So you have to be clever and interact with all the other cooperatives. So you need to be subtle. And even if you're a biologist, you should be observant of the humans you're working with. It's just a behavior study that you need to do on top of the other ones. So you need to understand the way they function, and that will give you some clues about what you do for the future. Uh, to show you just two experiences, working with the skippers of the tuna boats, it was an all-male society. They were very competitive with each other. So the issue was how to get them to compete to have the lowest dolphin mortality, not just the highest tuna catch. And you use the, the famous male Lego that many women know how well how to use. And you use that to propel change. And that was necessary, and that was done. The other communities is a completely different story. Uh, men fish, some women fish too, but the women do the marketing of the products. So the whole family needs to be involved in the solution, because if women are more aware of what it means if we lose a market, if we cannot export the fish, if we have a rejection of the product. So you need to work with the whole community. So you do workshops, and you have the grandparents and children running around and that's the margin of that so in one case you work one way in another case you work in another one and you have to figure that out and this is something that you no know, we've been saying for for several years and I know we share with for instance Larry Crowder which I can see in the crowd nodding we do need social scientists to improve this to make it faster the communication and to understand this better than what we do so this is something very important and I wish we had more. We had some very few ones, luckily. Uh, you see communities like this, and the problem is that there are way, way too many communities for a few individuals. So you need to look for ways of communication which are more effective in large scale. And uh, in the past, we have done this type of meetings and gatherings where you have all age groups, all people, and you discuss the issues with the whole community in front of you. Uh, okay, so the behavior of the persons working with the communities is something that is very uh, carefully scrutinized by fishermen. Uh, very frequently, fishermen have been spooked by interactions with people that go to a place uh, and with very little evidence something comes up in the media or somewhere creating a scandal about impacts and so on. Uh, I think that you should present the problem in accurate terms. You shouldn't place the blame or say who is doing what until you're absolutely sure of what is happening. One of the worst things you can do is an accusation that is not grounded. The paper that I have hidden the authors of the species to keep them anonymous was an accusation of a species was declining going towards extinction through fishermen of some type in some country. Well, the species was not declining, the impact was not by the fishers that were being mentioned. So after the community hears that, you can a few years after that and say, I want to do something, and you really don't get the same reception as you did before. So be very uh, moderate in stating facts. You have to at least have the evidence okay, and, and don't go too forward. Uh, and then these are sometimes the objective is uh, uh, another one, and we don't want, I don't want to uh, do too much on this on this subject, but it is very harmful to other people that may want to do something with that community. So you ruin the work for people coming. Uh, 
so when you interact with the community, you show very quickly that you're looking for an inclusive solution. You are not there to shut down the fishery. You don't need to be with the community if you're going to do that. You go to legal system or, or anything else. So you show them that you're looking for a solution with them. In our case, we established these two commandments, and it's a very short table of commandments, but simply that we wanted people that wanted to participate in this to be in agreement that we didn't want to kill turtles or drive them to extinction, but at the same time that we didn't want to put fishers out of work. So from the very beginning, it was a declaration of peace. No, the approach is to get an, object, uh, an objective that includes your future, and we are not planning to, to destroy that future. A important thing is to identify the best source of information uh, among the fishing community. So there are fishers with an amazing insight of the fishery, knowledge, and the willingness to share it, and the attitude. And there are others which are not, not as good. If you identify those, they are jewels, and we have been capable of communicating with the same skippers for 20, 25 years. We go now to see them, they are retired, but we still go with our issues to these gurus in the different fisheries that can really give you an idea. And some of them, I have one of the guys I like, is like 85, but he's still one of the most innovative minds in the industry. So when I have an odd idea, and I have quite a few of those, it's, he is one of the best sources for that. So I was just recently talking to him about um, fisheries in the past have been done by killing a lot of things, and then we decide what to keep. If you look at it that way, it just, uh, it's a very good way to describe it, and the fishers realize that that's what is happening. The future, the fisheries of the future should be captured alive and only kill what you mean to keep. And that's a revolutionary concept. And this guy immediately started turning around that. Can we use pumps to bring the tuna alive to the deck and so on? That's the kind of thing that can produce a revolution in fishing. These individuals with creative minds that are capable of, of tackling problems that are beyond the, the normal things. Uh, when you go with a solution to these communities, you need to be flexible. And in this country and some other countries, you may be able to do uh, very hard, very strict regulation. Most of the world, you're going to have to do it in a different way. You don't have enforcement. You don't have the political will. So you need to accommodate if you want to succeed. So top down doesn't exist. So you need to work on something that is feasible to be accepted. And uh, the example of the hooks, we went with a the largest hooks because they were the most effective. It didn't work with the bait they have. They couldn't put their bait, and their bait was free because they were catching it at sea. So they like 16, the second size, so we went with the second size. And in other fishery, we went with still another size. Uh, we could do a lot of gaining in reducing turtle mortality, but the hooks were accepted. If you have to force it, you know it's not going to happen in the long term. So you, you need to be... Uh, 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 flexible in, in that. Uh, you analyze how practical the solutions are, and I'm going to do here the example of the entanglements. Uh, many turtles get entangled, and we did the observation in several countries in the continent. It was a big problem, and we thought a big source of mortality. They entangled close to the floats, we observed that, but thanks to our gear technologies, they realized that the countries where the problem was there were the countries where the lines were made out of polypropylene or polyethylene, which are buoyant. They float. So the line floats, turtles go swimming, leather bags or turtles with long flippers, and they wrap up the line and they get entangled. In other places where there was monofilament in the lines, the lines were rigid and the turtles did not get entangled. So we compare regions and, so, and countries. So what do we do? Replace all the lines for monofilament? It couldn't be done because they could not handle the lines by hand if it was monofilament. So you would destroy in there the way of operation. So that was not a workable solution. So with a group of people, we came up with this idea of the inverted T, which is just changing a small part of the line by monofilament. That's enough to bring the line down near the floats, and the entanglement went down 90%. 
So that was cheap. They could do that without changing the way they operate. Uh, some fishermen didn't like the idea of cutting the, long, the mother line in two places. So we came up with a second set of inventions replacing the inverted T by an inverted I with a weight. So now we have something that the fishers are very happy to use because they eliminate entanglements with other boats. And the entanglement with turtles are also problematic for them. And this is quite cheap, so the person who did the last experiments from, uh, was in the government of Ecuador, he's working in WWF Ecuador now, he is beginning the change of a whole fishing village to this design as a, a model for the other places. But this was to totally brought to something that was acceptable to them, yet it solved the problem. Uh, most of the things that we do are tested in fishing boats in normal fishing conditions. We don't do uh, research boats or charters. They have to do it with their own hands, with their own equipment, and we insist on that. And sometimes the problems are, uh, how do I store circle hooks if I use this other system with the J hooks and it works? So you have to solve practical problems and work with them in those, and you have to demonstrate as much as you can. Uh, another issue is, uh, turtles are going to get hooked. We can hook a lot less with circle hooks, so it's good, but some are going to get hooked. So the next step is releasing them. And you feel great when you can remove the hook and release a turtle. I can say for my own experience, you feel that that's a complete process. The question is, is the turtle as happy as you are? And sometimes removing the hook is not the best thing you can do for the turtle. So that's one of the reasons why you need to put science to this. And as, as same as social scientists, veterinarians are also important. We cannot improvise ways to do things when there is a science to do that. So we brought the veterinarians to see, and this was our model, uh, incidentally recruited at the Crete Symposium uh, of your society. And after telling us about how using anesthesia and all these things in the Mediterranean turtles, I, we asked, can you do that in a moving fishing boat and not in, a, uh, not in an aquarium? And uh, she was recruited, did a fantastic job, fishermen extremely happy. And with her, we determined the best ways to handle the turtles, when to hook, when not to the hook. Uh, we produced a video in Spanish and English, which is available if anybody's interested. And the most important thing, we brought those ideas to the fishers with an explanation of why. You don't just put a decree, do this. You do this because if you don't do it, this is what happens. If you remove this hook, you may hurt this part of the mouth, and this is connected to the lungs, blah, blah, blah. So you do with an explanation, and I think that's something that helps you connect with the fishing community very much. At the end of the game, you need to look at the results of your proposals, and you need to look at everything with an ecological mindset, and this is something that is very important. There are modifications to reduce bycatch which are specific for the bycatch problem. The dolphin back down only releases dolphin, doesn't change anything. The tory lines to scare birds on long lines only affect birds. But when you change hook size, shape, mesh size, you're going to change everything in the net. So you need to look at the results. And this, the second and third column are what you catch with J hooks and with some type of circle hook. This is a, an example of a table only. So you need to look at this and you say, are we doing okay with the turtles, which is a lower group? Yes, you're doing pretty well with the turtles. Are you doing well with the with the targets, which is what the fishers are going to be looking at. Yes, you're doing okay. If there is no big overfishing, you're okay. But then you are catching, as major targets, a couple of sharks, which are in very bad shape. So your solution for the turtles catches more sharks than before. So is that a good idea? And that answer should not come as a turtle person. Should come as an ecologist. Yeah? And it's something that we have this taxonomic bias that we need to remove from our brains. We need to look at the whole perspective. We are talking about ecosystem-based fisheries management. If we are tied to a taxon, it's very difficult to do that. But you have to think in general. And after you look at that to decide if it's a good idea or not, then you look at the table again as somebody has to make a living with what you're catching. What am I losing? What am I gaining? How much is this valuable? How much is the other one? So you need to look at that. Uh, 
in some cases, there are social consequences that you cannot perceive directly through the figures. So for instance, uh, this girl makes about $5 a day cleaning bait from hooks. Uh, I wish she didn't have to do that, but she does that, and she contributes to her family economy with that. If you switch long lines for traps, these people lose their jobs. You have to look at the consequences, and sometimes they are removed from where you are. So in some of these communities, there is a domino effect in all directions when you take an action, so you have to be aware. So it has been fantastic working on bycatch for somebody who, like me, I think I have a, some kind of attention deficit disorder issue because I love jumping from thing to thing. I you know you work with sharks this week, turtles next week, and it just favors my idea that always learning new things is fantastic, and I'm always up to the new one. And to work in bycatch effectively, you need to know the creatures you're working with and you're trying to, to save. You need to know something about the targets to see which are the differences in their characteristics and so on, if you can take advantage of those. As I said, you need to know the technology of the fishery, the social structure of the fishery, and then the environment, understand what is the effect of currents or even the economic market to see where do you have the levers. So, Working in these bycatch issues is one of the biggest challenges that you can face. It's not just something that the university prepares you for that. You have to do a lot of your own work. You have to invent your textbooks because they are not there. And you have to become observant of things that you were not trained what to do. So working on bycatch is one of the biggest challenges. And I, that's one of the reasons why I invite uh, young people to jump into this, because it's something which is a, a worthwhile challenge. And finally, uh, this is something that I'll give you a couple of seconds to read. You didn't expect to have an answer to the meaning of life in a sea turtle symposium, <laughs> but you got it. So for young people, for the not so young, for those which want to get involved in this, this is a huge, huge challenge, and it's worthwhile of your time and your efforts, and uh, never lose steam and never lose hope and optimism, because we do, between all of us together, I think we can do quite a few things. Thank you.